I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to organize my talk around uh, three pieces. One is I want to uh, convince you, try to convince you that we are on a slow motion train wreck uh, as far as healthcare costs are concerned. Second, I want to try to explain a little bit about why that might be happening. And third, I want to give you some thoughts about what we could do about it and how we could reverse that. Um, before I do that, though, in true Canadian fashion, I want to start with a couple of apologies. First of all, I have a little bit of a cold, and so I'd like to apologize to the next two speakers because I think they have to use this same mic. <laughs> so, um, and secondly, I'd like to apologize to all of you for having to, uh, or for me claiming that I have some, uh, some original thoughts on this topic. I'm actually not a healthcare economist. I'm an immunologist by training and a molecular biologist by profession, so um, I'm going to take a whack at this, and I think that this is actually uh, an area that's uh, of great interest to me personally, um, but there are probably a lot of people who um, might have access to a lot of data that I don't have access to. Um, nevertheless, hopefully this will, uh, um, you'll find it interesting and stimulating. So let's talk about, <coughs> Let's talk about the cost of health care. Um, I think that uh, it was an interesting coincidence that about two weeks ago, the Canadian Society of Actuaries put out a report, and uh, I really do appreciate them um, putting this in, right in the executive summary of the report. The findings indicate that the Canadian health care system in its current form is not sustainable. <laughs> That was sort of my, like, the whole theme of what I was trying to talk about, so it was very, very handy that they actually put this report out just a couple weeks ago. Um, why is it not sustainable? Well, <clears throat> this is uh, the percent of prov provincial revenue spent on health care. This is where we are today. Um, you know, about 45% uh, or so of, of revenue is spent on health care. If you extrapolate the current trends, by 2037, we'll be spending 103% of all provincial revenue on health care. So I think it's pretty clear that we're going to need some money, possibly for education, <laughs> probably for one or two other things. So having 103% of our revenue spent on health care is pretty much um, a non-starter. Why is it that this is the case? Well, this graph shows actual health care spending in Canada from 1975 to 2012. This line here that starts at about um, maybe 10 billion and it ends up at about 200 billion is actual expenditures. And this line is if you correct for inflation, the one that starts about 40 billion and ends up at about 140 billion. So even if you correct for inflation, our expenditures on health care have increased threefold in the last um, few decades. So I think it's pretty clear um, that we are on a trend that's not uh, sustainable. But I think a, a more interesting question is why are our health care costs growing so dramatically? I'm going to I'm going to pose a few uh, potential reasons for that. Um, it's by no means an exhaustive list. There are many reasons, but I'm going to hit on some of the highlights. Number one, our population is aging. Um, this was touched on earlier. Um, basically, uh, the percent of uh, our population today that's 65 or older is about 12%. Uh, and it's projected that by 2030, the percent of our population that's going to be 65 or older is going to be 20%. Now, some of that is actually due to uh, longevity, the discussion that we had earlier. Um, but some of it is also because of um, the baby boomer effect. And again, that's the, as was touched on earlier, you know, this, this is something, this is a very important trend because this percentage, 20% age 65 or older, that means that the percent that are in the, you know, sort of primary um, years of, uh, of contributing to GDP um, are, is also going to be less. So <clears throat> the other reason that this is important is shown on this graph. So if you're my age, about 45 to 49, you cost the healthcare system about $2,400 a year on average. 
Uh, people who are aged about 65 to 69 cost about 6,000 uh, on average, 85 to 89 about 24,000 on average, and 90 plus about $26,000 a year on average. So the point being that as the population ages, these these healthcare costs are going to go up even more dramatically than they have so far because an aging population is an expensive population. I'm, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, by the way, might not sound that nice to hear, but these are data. I mean, I, I'm a scientist, so <laughs> I'm just going to say it. <clears throat> another thing uh, that is contributing to this is another thing that we've also discussed earlier today, um, obesity and poor fitness. Um, about 35% of our population in Canada is overweight and 25% is obese. Now, I don't, I, it, was, it was actually difficult to find trends as to what these data would have looked like uh, 25, 30 years ago, but I did find some for kids. And um, in 1989, 2% of kids were um, obese. In 2006, 10% of boys and 9% of girls are obese. So if there's, I think it's pretty clear from data in the United States, but not so much from data here, uh, that this trend would extend also to adults, um, that generally speaking, it would be worse. So I think that clearly, um, this is a major contributor to increasing health costs, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Third is cost of medications. These are uh, including prescription uh, medicines and generic medicines. And in 1985, the total cost of uh, all of these medications was about $4 billion. Today, the total cost is about $33 billion. So uh, the growth has been uh, about 725% over uh, the course of the last couple of decades. So. Um, Obviously, uh, there's a lot of reasons as to why this is happening, and I can't really, in the amount of time allotted, go into that, but um, suffice to say that uh, uh, prescription drugs, in particular, have been skyrocketing uh, when it comes to the overall impact on our healthcare costs. So, let's uh, switch gears now and talk about um, what we can do about all this. How could we potentially solve this problem this slow motion train wreck that we're all on. Well, one possibility is we could just reduce costs by reducing the quality and the quantity of service. This, in fact, is what we've been doing for the last three years. Since 2009, the dollars that we, the growth, sorry, that we, that we have experienced in healthcare costs has actually been about the same as our growth in GDP. So for the last three years, we've actually been about on the right track as far as uh, growth. But how have we done that? We have actually not done that any, any other way than basically reducing the amount of uh, service that you all have, enjoy access to. Um, the reason that we've, that we've had reductions in service is because uh, of the recession. So basically, provincial bu budgets shrank. And as they shrank, people just had less money to spend, and so they cut. They cut here, they cut there. And that's why um, costs have actually been a little more in line just for the last two or three years. But I don't think that reducing quality and quantity of service is actually uh, what we really want, especially when you look at the, the trends, some of the other, other trends I was talking about in terms of population aging and stuff like that. We're, we're actually, we would have to basically cut the quality of service that we get in half just to keep up with all of those other trends. So this is the approach we've been taking, but I don't think it's the, the best approach. I think there's a better way for us to do this. And I'm going um, to talk about a few ideas that we could, uh, that we could um, make use of here. One is make medicine more personalized. Just out of curiosity, how many people have av actually ever heard the term personalized medicine? Um, raise your hand if you've heard the term personalized medicine. Okay, that's awesome, because the conferences that I go to, basically it's like a buzzword and everybody's heard it. And so, so for me, um, this is a, something that's talked about a lot in my industry, um, but uh, it's something that I think has actually got, kind of gotten to the level of consciousness of the 
general public um, only in a very limited way. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm talking about here. Um, I only have American data for this section, so I apologize for that as well. But um, the impact of adverse drug reactions in the United States. Greater than 2 million patients every year have an adverse drug reaction. It results in greater than 100,000 deaths. By the way, the rule of thumb, generally speaking, if you want to move this into the Canadian setting, is just divided by 10. So that'll give you a, a rough. So results in about 100,000 deaths in the United States. And the annual cost of drug-related morbidity and mortality is estimated to be $136 billion. So it's pretty expensive. There's actually, uh, there are actually tools available um, today which could cut out a lot of this uh, problem, and we're not making use of them. We're not making use of them very much in the States, but we're making use of it even less in Canada. And um, <clears throat> I, as, a, as a, a point of sort of full disclosure here, the company that I work, work for actually does make a test that's in this sort of general category. Um, however, because there's no market in Canada, we don't sell it in Canada, so there's nothing, my company has nothing to be gained by me actually standing up here and talking about it. So uh, hopefully that's, um, that's okay with you. I'm using this as an example. So cytochrome P450 enzymes are enzymes that metabolize about 80% of the drugs that we take today. These cytochrome P450 enzymes are important because they actually determine the rate at which your body clears these drugs. And so if you're something called a poor metabolizer, then when you take, uh, let's say, um, Tylenol, there's a pretty good chance that you are at much greater risk of having liver, liver damage and having an adverse event from liver, liver damage than if you're a normal metabolizer. And about 7% of Caucasians are poor metabolizers and about 25% uh, of Chinese Canadians are uh, poor metabolizers. So the bottom line is that um, we can actually very easily determine a lot of information about how you metabolize these drugs and whether or not you could actually have an, one of these adverse events um, just by doing a very simple genetic test, but we don't do it. So <clears throat> based on uh, your 2D6, this enzyme in your liver, your 2D6 uh, genotype, you might be at uh, risk of an adverse reaction. You might be taking drugs but not getting any therapeutic benefit because uh, the, the drug isn't getting metabolized into an active form in your body. Or you might be clearing the drug so quickly that it's also not doing really anything. There are 37 drugs that have been approved by FDA that have a black box warning. A black box warning basically means that um, FDA has highlighted some significant risk associated with your safety from taking that drug. 37 drugs have a black box warning that recommend 2D6 testing. In Canada, 2D6 testing to determine risk of adverse events for individual patients is almost non-existent. So this is something that would be easy to implement and um, would, is just one example of the way your, your genotype could actually uh, inform a much better level of uh, information about what medicines you should take and, and what they'll do for you. This actually brings up an interesting point. I'm, I'm, uh, if I seem a little bit nervous, it's probably not because I'm up here um, um, speaking. It's because I sent in, I, I actually sent in for the first time, a, um, you know, I got, a, I, I sent in a spit sample I spit in a tube and I sent it to a company in the United States um, called 23andMe. That's how many chromosomes each of us have. Actually, we have 46, but um, they're duplicates. So. Um, so I sent in my sample and in about a week, I'm gonna get my whole genome result back. So I have no idea what it's gonna say, but it's gonna test for you know, probably about 100 different potential diseases that I could have um, you know, a predisposition for. So we'll find out, um, I'll let you know in a week what, uh, what that looks. But I'm really on pins and needles here, it's, it's, it's a little bit scary. Okay, so anyway, uh, second way that I think we can improve the situation with regards to healthcare costs is we can change the setting. Um, in general, home care and hospice care is much cheaper than hospital care. Hospital care is incredibly expensive. Um, 
And in fact, this is actually something that I think in many ways we've, we've been doing pretty well. A recent UK study found, though, that about 48% of people who died in a hospital had no medical need to be there, and that's generally the, the case um, in North America as well. So um, I think that there are, that's just one data piece that suggests that we could actually move people to more uh, low-cost settings without actually compromising care. Third, make healthcare more efficient. An example is electronic medical records. Um, if you had a single electronic file that recorded all of your medical history, any medication that you're taking or ever have taken, any allergic reactions, etc., and that this file traveled with you electronically to every single doctor you visit, every single healthcare institution you ever visited, the amount of um, improvements that could be made just, made just in the efficiency of understanding what your medical history is, I think would be tremendous. This doesn't even take into account the possibility that we could do things like uh, wellness visits um, by video conferencing or uh, all kinds of other approaches that would actually save the healthcare system even more money. So I think there's a lot of imp uh, room for improvements in efficiency. And fourthly, and this is my uh, second last one, um, measure comparative effectiveness in order to make difficult trade-off decisions. Comparative effectiveness is basically um, uh, uh, another sort of, in my, in my world, another buzzword. Um, basically what it is is doing studies to actually measure uh, whether one approach to medicine is better than another approach. And this, the amount of information that's available in this area is actually shockingly poor. Um, we do not actually spend much time measuring what's better than what we're doing today. And so a lot of the times it comes down to politics. It comes down to people basically, uh, like we, a lot of times we don't tackle tough decisions because it's politically uh, you know, unwise to do so. But if we had data, then we could actually make some decisions about uh, some of these things. So identify opportunities to use innovation to, pr to both improve care and lower costs. It, this could allow us to provide a data-driven approach to drug pricing. For instance, if there's an oncology drug that extends people's lives on average by three months, is that a, is that a drug that we should be willing to pay for, that we should approve? If so, how much should we be willing to pay for it? versus all of the other things that we could do with that same amount of money. Those are not easy decisions to make, but they're even harder when you don't have any data to make them with. All right, and then lastly, and this is one that's um, particularly dear to my heart, and uh, I, was, um, I was really uh, pleased with the participation presentation um, because uh, for the similar reasons. So focus on healthcare instead of disease care. Our whole healthcare system is actually constructed around waiting until you get sick and then treating you. I don't think that's really the best way to, um, to manage a railroad, as they say. Um, I think that uh, what we could be doing is um, spending a lot more time on education and trying to um, get people to understand the benefits and give them economic incentives for the benefits of um, wellness. And just to give you an idea, I think that what we're actually missing here is, frankly, collective willpower, collective determination. Look at, look at some of this stuff with uh, smoking. You know, this picture, that's disgusting. The, <laughs> I like this one, the cigarette. Tobacco use can make you impotent. That's pretty stark. Um, cigarettes cause strokes. Cigarettes cause lung cancer. So the interesting thing about this is that um, in 90, 1996, smoking rate was 25%. In 2012, it's 16%. So I would say this is a fairly effective um, message, effective education program. Now let me remind you about obesity. In 1989, 2%. In 2006, 9.5%. And these are in kids. You know, we're not showing enough determination. That's, that's what I think it is. Really, it's, we're just not determined enough, and we're not providing enough economic incentives. So let me throw out some ideas. I don't know if these would be good policies, but I'll throw out some ideas. What about a sugar tax on unhealthy food? We could take some money that we collect from a sugar tax, and we could put it to an incentive for purchase of vegetables and whole grains. 
A lot of people say it's actually cheaper to go to McDonald's than to, to actually shop and buy healthy food. That's a travesty. That's fixable. Educational programs, greater access to fitness programs, not just for kids either, seniors. You know, remember the chart that I showed about the, the cost curve? I think that Aquafit, for instance, is something that could be made available to every senior. We make it a free program. Why not? It just takes some determination. OK, so let's say that this actually works, and people we've managed to get society to be more fit. Would that actually save any money? Because unfortunately, all of us are going to die eventually, no matter how fit we are. So do the costs go up anyway? I think um, that maybe somebody has data on that. I couldn't find any. I spent a couple days looking for data. Do fit people die more cheaply than unfit people? I would propose that probably they do. Because in the last couple decades of life, there's most li more likely going to be less chronic disease, less use of medications, less use of hospital care. But shockingly, I actually could not find any studies or data which suggests whether or not, which, which addresses that question. Do fit people die more cheaply? So I would suggest that that's one of the comparative effectiveness research studies that are urgently needed. Maybe um, the data is out there, in which case I would, I would be very curious. Another thing that we could do at the, at the federal level is partner with employers. Why not give employers strong incentives to promote wellness with their employees? Now, the, you actually would be right if you pointed out that there's already a strong incentive just from having healthier emplo uh, employees and that's true. When you have a wellness program, for every dollar that you spend, medical costs fall by $3.27, and the cost of absenteeism falls by $2.73. So that's a 600% return on investment before the government even gets involved at all. But we could go further. We could provide inv uh, um, incentive programs for employers to make investments in uh, this particular area. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. That's, that's my talk. Um, if I can leave you with one, one thing and one thing only, it's that I think um, we need to stop focusing on treating disease and start focusing on making people healthy. And that's, I think, what I'd really like to leave people with. Um, I'd like to also recommend this book, Younger Next Year or Younger Next Year for Women by Chris Crowley and Henry Lodge. This was one uh, thing that I read that sort of really started me on a personal journey of uh, getting excited about, um, uh, about how to maintain fitness. The other thing that happened is about seven or eight years ago, I made the mistake of listening to Chris Mermitz when he said, hey, why don't we go for a little run? And we, a little run turned out to be 17 kilometers. And uh, since then, you know, we've done a few marathons together and a lot of other crazy stuff. So anyway, I appreciate uh, the impact that Chris has had on me as well. So I suspect I might be over time, but anyway, thanks very much.